The term instrument has a broad definition. As a minimum requirement, an instrument must be able to measure or record or modify a physical quantity. Long time ago, when people try to trade their products, they try to gauge the value of their products with certain standards. In other words, long time ago, there's already a need for measurement. But what really led to the improvement of the process of measurement is the industrial revolution because a lot of technology spawned out during that time. When you want to innovate or improve something, you must be able to quantify or describe the parts or the things that you want to improve. And hence, new instruments and measurement techniques were developed and they were developed hand in hand. And this is where instrumentation physics comes in. Instrumentation physics is an umbrella term that deals with the study and the development of scientific instruments using physics concepts and its applications to other disciplines. Instrumentation physics encompasses the design of instrument used for acquiring data, process control, systems communication, and systems operation. It also deals with microchips and sensor development, operation and repair of technologies in medicine, chemical industries, and government facilities, and the design of test equipment and test softwares. Whether an instrument is applied in the industry or used in scientific research, it must always be accurate. And from an economic standpoint, an instrument must not be extremely expensive and at the same time, it must be cost-effective. So there must be a balance between accuracy and cost. Of course, when money or funding is not an issue, engineers and scientists just focus on accuracy. Research shows that accuracy is achieved when features of digital computing and a little bit of automation is infused with the instrument. That's why a basic knowledge of analog and digital electronics is helpful in instrumentation physics. Also, to improve other advanced or complex instruments, a basic knowledge of software and hardware engineering is required. And at the heart of automation, sensors, transducers, and actuators are inclusive topics in instrumentation physics. Let's start with one of the possible functions of an instrument which is to measure something. But before that, let's refresh our minds with the concept of measurement. In order for scientists, engineers, and other professionals to effectively communicate with one another, the measurement process must be standardized. This includes reporting of numerical values with proper units, uncertainties, errors, conversion of units, preservation of significant figures, usage of notation like scientific notation, etc. In our class, we will follow the SI unit or the International System of Units. It is commonly known as the metric system and it is the international standard for measurement. Currently, this system defines seven fundamental quantities as standards. Length is the measurement of distance between two points. The SI basic unit of length is meter. Meter is defined as the length traveled by light in an interval of 1 over 299,792,458 seconds. Time is the quantitative measure of the flow of events. The SI basic unit of time is second. One second is defined as the time required for 9.1926 times 10 raised to 9 cycles of radiation from vaporized cesium-133. Temperature is a quantity that represents the degree of hotness or coldness of a system. The SI basic unit of temperature is Kelvin. 273.16 Kelvin is defined as the temperature difference between absolute zero Kelvin and the triple point of water. Current is the amount of charge that passes a given point per unit time. The SI basic unit of current is ampere. One ampere is defined by taking the fixed numerical value of elementary charge E to be 1.6 times 10 raised to negative 19 coulomb that pass one second. Luminous intensity is a quantitative measure of power emitted by a light source in a direction per unit solid angle. The SI basic unit of luminous intensity is candela. One candela is equivalent to a luminous intensity from a monochromatic source at 540 terahertz and with radiant density of 1.4641 milliwatts per steradian. The SI basic unit of any matter is mole. One mole of something is the same as the number of atoms in a 0.012 kilogram mass of carbon-12. When we talk about plane angle, we specify it with a unit of radian. But when we talk about solid angle, then we specify it with a unit of steradian. 
Notice that I did not include a unit of mass here. That's because the SI unit of mass, which is kilogram, is actually derived from three fundamental physical constants. The Planck constant H, a specific atomic transition frequency in delta nu, and the speed of light C. Measurement is the process of assigning a number and a unit to a physical quantity by comparing it with a standard of the same physical dimension. When you have multiple measurements and you don't have a standard numerical value, then you can still describe its degree of fineness and this degree of closeness of value is called precision. To represent precision, we can calculate for percent difference. This is the formula for percent difference when you have two measurements, x sub 1 and x sub 2. X bar here means the mean of the measurements. This is the formula for percent difference when you have multiple measurements. On the other hand, when you have a standard numerical value, you can describe a measurement's accuracy by computing the percent error. Here, X sub MV pertains to the measured value while X sub SV pertains to the standard value. An error can be classified as either a systematic error or a random error. A systematic error is an error that occurs because there's something wrong with the instrument or that the instrument is not properly used by the experimenter. On the other hand, a random error is an error that occurs simply because there is uncertainty in every measurement process. In order to avoid confusion between the two types of errors, Consider a measurement where a true value is known. However, when you perform multiple trial measurements, the experimental values are always higher than the true value. In this case, there occurs a systematic error during measurement. Now what if you perform a different multiple trial measurements, but this time, all the experimental values shift to a lower value than the true value? In this case, this is still considered as a systematic error. Now how about the case where you perform multiple trial measurements, but this time the experimental values fluctuate from the true value in such a way sometimes it is higher and sometimes it is lower. Then in this case, we have a random error. Instruments can be classified in whether the quantity being measured regulates the electric signal an instrument possesses, or the instrument output is the actual quantity that is being measured. An active instrument is an instrument in which the quantity to be measured regulates the electric power inside the instrument. The voltage output is then translated to a specific measurement. For example, in an ultrasonic flow indicator, if the rate of liquid flow inside the pipe speeds up between the two contact points, this change is detected by the instrument and converted into an electrical signal and then sent to a data receiver. Obviously, for this system, an input power source must be supplied to the system. On the other hand, a passive instrument does not require an input power source to perform measurements. For example, when a glass thermometer measures temperature, the contraction or expansion of the liquid inside it gives a direct reading of temperature. It is able to show the measurement without the need for electrical energy input. Also, instruments can be classified whether there is a need to adjust its moving parts into a zero level or not. A null type instrument is an instrument that needs to return to a zero level mark to indicate a measurement. A good example would be a physician scale. Initially, the instrument's beam is at a zero level or is at a null level. When a person steps on the platform, the beam suddenly falls down. We then adjust the weights so that the beam returns to its null level position. When it returns to null level, the position of the weight points to a specific measurement on the beam. In this system, we assume that the beam weights effectively counters or balances the torque produced by the person's weight. On the other hand, a deflection type instrument is an instrument where the actual measurement causes physical changes that displaces the instrument's moving part. This moving part usually points to a label that displays the value of the measurement. The positioning of the label is a result of careful calibration of the instrument. For example, a weighing scale has a moving part that deflects when an object is placed on its platform. 
Consider this demonstration. The moving pointer is set to zero when there's no load on the platform. But when an object is loaded on its platform, the object's weight causes the weighing scale's pointer to deflect on another position in such a way it points to the equivalent weight of the object. Apparently, this weighing scale has been calibrated well so that it displays accurate measurement. Instruments can also be classified whether they display a measurement output that varies continuously or they display an output that varies in discrete amount. An analog instrument is an instrument that displays an output that varies continuously. Returning to our weighing scale, even if the label increases in discrete steps, the pointer is deflected in a continuous manner. It can display a value of 2 kilograms or 2.4 kilograms or 2.41 kilograms or 2.415 kilograms and so on. On the other hand, a digital instrument has an output that varies in discrete amount. Consider a digital balance. When an object is loaded on its platform, the screen displays a weight that is in discrete intervals of 1 gram or 0.5 gram. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and hit the notification bell button for awesome updates. Thank you for watching!